I'm Mr. Eddie, President of America, and welcome to Should I Tune In, the wacky show where I take a look at everything animated. And wacky is the word that fits the thing we're looking at today. DC movies, the live action ones, they seem to be slightly hit or miss lately. Like, he's hungry. Really miss. Like, going down swinging on your third strike, man. What the hell are you doing over there, DC? <clears throat> While the live-action department hasn't been amazing, DC has actually had a fairly good lineup of animated stuff. The stuff with actual flesh and blood people might be kind of lifeless, but their animation department is full of life. This leads me to their newest release, Return of the Caped Crusader. Long story short, this is a feature-length animated film based on the old 1960s Batman TV series. You know the one I'm talking about. <laughs> While the old series might have been cheesy, low-budget, wacky, hamly acted, there's no denying that the people that made this show were having so much fun that you can't help enjoying it even though it's over-the-top campy. It's completely infectious. That being said, this is a show from the 60s. It's now 2016, and I'd be lying if I said I wasn't really surprised that DC was making a full animated feature-length film as a tribute to the old show. At a time when DC keeps just going darker and more serious, I'm really shocked they released something based off such a silly old TV show. And I'd also be lying if I said I wasn't surprised how good this movie was. I'm serious. This movie captures the old show to a T. It's over the top. It's silly. It's cliche. It's wacky. And it's so much fun that I had a smile on my face from the beginning to the end. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's tackle this movie one bat note at one bat time. First off, the animation style is really good, but I've come to expect that from DC's work. That being said, they got the style of the old show down pat, and the animation is smooth, bright, full of life, and it's just appealing to the eyes. I particularly like the final fight scene. The lighting effect is great. And no, you might notice that I'm not showing you that scene right now because I don't want to give any way twists away. This is going to be completely spoiler free, even though I really don't think you can spoil a movie like this. I don't want to ruin any of the gags. There's actually one thing I want to spoil like later on, like right at the very, very end, I'll give you a chance to back out, but it's like my favorite line from the entire movie, and it comes right at the end, so I'll save it for that. But from the opening scene to the final credits, the animation is top notch. Uh, except for one part. Look, I don't want to nitpick, but I mean, hell, that's what we're here for. But for some reason, for about 10 seconds early in the movie, the movie switches from its 2D animation to butt ugly 3D CGI as the Batmobile leaves the Batcave. And it's not good. It's really cringeworthy. I mean, look at that. What, what the hell is happening here? Did they lose their 2D animation that they did for the scene and they just used footage from a PlayStation 2 game for the bit? Although I think a PlayStation 2 animation might be better. And the funny thing is, that's the only scene that does it so blatantly bad. It stands out like a sore thumb. I have no explanation for it. All right, next thing that we have to talk about are the voice actors. Adam West and Burt Ward reprise their roles from the old TV show as Batman and Robin, and despite their age, they do a fantastic job. They both sound really much like their old selves, it's amazing. I honestly cannot stress how good a job these two do. They put everything they have into reading their cheesy lines, and that matters a lot. Much like the old show, the dialogue is ham-fisted and cheesy, and if the acting was poor, it would be painful. But because they had so much life to the role, they, instead of being awful, it's fun. It's fantastic. You two sure do fish a lot. We find it's a great way to relax from the pressures of being a millionaire playboy and his teenage ward. Indeed. Zero. Zilch. Goose egg. Precisely. Lex parsimony. Latin for law of parsimony? Good job. Your grasp of the dead languages has improved. No language can be dead if it lives in your heart. Sadly, not all of the original cast could reprise their roles, but the actors they have filling in those roles did a great job. William Salyers, and I hope I'm saying that right, does a great Burgess Meredith playing the Penguin. I think the Penguin came off the weakest of the three villains, but that has nothing to do with his voice acting skills. It's just that the Joker and the Riddler are much more over-the-top characters. Speaking of the Riddler, Wally Wingert is a perfect fit, and that's not surprising since he's just reprising his role from the Arkham Asylum games. While in the Arkham games he has a much darker version of the Riddler, Wingert is still able to take that same egotistical know-it-all tone of voice and also add the over-the-top campiness that Frank Gorshin brought to the role back in the 60s. Music. Then you have Jeff Bergman as the Joker. Bergman has been a Warner Brother actor for quite a while now, and it's clear he knows what he's doing. He captures the spirit of Cesar Romero as a much less dark and more silly Joker. 
He even has Romero's laugh down. But the whole daddies have decided to play a smaller venue, the broom closet backstage. <laughs> yeah, it's no Mark Hamill, but this is a different Joker. This is from a time when instead of throwing a pie made out of acid to kill Batman, he would just throw regular pies. And what can I say? It's the Silver Age of comics. Stuff like that was normal. At least he didn't talk about boners in this. Yeah, that's a real comic. Not all of the voice acting was great, though. This is the part of the review where I feel like a complete jerk. But I have to be honest here, Julie Newmore comes back to reprise her role as Catwoman, and her voice didn't age quite as gracefully as Wester Ward. It's not that she's terrible, far from it. It's just that she sounds so asleep for the entire movie. Enough caterwauling. None of it'll matter if Batman stops us like he always does. While everyone else has a ton of energy in their roles, she sounds like she just took a triple shot of NyQuil. And I know that's not fair. I mean, maybe she's an actress and not a voice actress. They are very different gigs. And she's also like a hundred years old, and she's not terrible in what she does. It even pulls off a few good punchlines, but it's just compared to everyone else's acting, it's just noticeable that she's a step behind everyone. And I feel like I'm picking on someone's grandmother, so let's move on. The story was the thing that surprised her the most, and like I said, I'm not going to spoil anything. I'm going to keep it all very general. The first 30 minutes of the movie is a loving recreation of the original show. It hits nearly every single trope you would want as a fan of the original series. The bat transitions, the ridiculous bat gadgets, the punches with onomatopoeia added to them, and yes, that is the literary term for stuff like pows and whams. See, it's not all wackiness here, sometimes you can accidentally learn things. It even has the purposely goody-goody over-the-top dialogue. Not so fast, old chum. But we're in a hurry, Batman! Jaywalking is extremely hazardous, especially at night. <laughs> it gets better. As duly deputized officers of the law, it is imperative we follow the rules. Gosh, yes, you're right, Batman. No one's above the law, even when you're trying to enforce it. You know you're in for a good time when the show opens with an awesome recreation of the typical opening of the 60s show, with Dick doing something absolutely ridiculous, in this case ballet, and Bruce extolling its virtues. Although, since it is a loving tribute to the show, I do think it misses an opportunity here or there. Like, they do the classic wall climbing scene like you'd expect, but no one pops out of a window. There was always a celebrity cameo that popped out of the window when they would pretend to be climbing up the wall. In this case, they missed an easy joke where actor Adam West could have poked out his head or something. Also, as you'd expect, there are the death trap scenes which would always be the transition from episode one to episode two. You see, back in the day, the old Batman show would always be a two-parter. And do I have to explain all this? Everyone's got the idea, right? Well, the point is, there was always a wonderful, ridiculous death trap and always an unbelievably wacky escape that's always played straight lace. What was missing, though, was the announcer. You see, in the original series, between episodes one and two, the announcer would always hype things up. Like if Batman was trapped in a giant mousetrap, the announcer would go, Trapped like a bat? How will Batman spring out of this one? Tune in, same bat time, same bat channel. Things certainly are turning the wrong way for them. It's not that big a deal, but I felt like it was an obvious gag that was sorely missing. As I said, the first 30 minutes felt like the animated version of the old show, with some obvious lampooning of it as well, but not mean-spiritedly mocking it, just poking it gently. Does that make sense? I will admit, the movie built up so wackily and so quickly in those 30 minutes, I thought it was not be able to maintain its steam. And fortunately, that wasn't the case at all. It's about that time, just as you might get tired of all the lampooning and parody, that the story changes gears in a direction I wasn't expecting. Like I said, not giving anything away, but the movie managed to tell an original story based off the old series while still keeping the tropes of it. So it felt fresh, but still felt like a loving tribute to the original series. I'm honestly impressed that they were able to pull that off. I mean, don't get me wrong, this isn't the Dark Knight levels of serious storytelling. I mean, it's not even Batman the Animated Series level of serious storytelling. Although, actually, I probably should reverse them. Batman the Animated Series was a much better series than the Dark Knight movies. That being said, this movie is able to tell an interesting, original, and fun, coherent story while never losing its irreverent, fun sense of wackiness. There's one more thing I want to talk about this movie, and that's the question that I always ask. Should I tune in? Well, here's the thing. 
I loved this movie. This was a fun movie from the beginning to the end, and any fan of the original series is going to gush over this. So yes, if you're a fan of the original series, yes, absolutely you should go watch this. But the thing is, what if you never watched the original series? What then? That's going to be a much tougher sell, if I'm going to be honest. So much of the humor comes off of playing off the tropes of the old show. So if you're not aware of those tropes, they could come off as bad writing, bad acting, and weird stilted dialogue with weird non sequiturs. I mean, take a look at the jaywalking scene again. Not so fast, old chum. But we're in a hurry, Batman. Jaywalking is extremely hazardous, especially at night. That's hilarious if you know how goody-goody and camply straight-laced Batman and Robin were in the original show. But a kid today that only knows Batman from Batman v Superman, and God do I weep for that child, but still, that child would look at that scene and go, what the hell was that? That kid would be completely lost, both because of the stiff dialogue and also because Batman wasn't stabbing people's necks while CGI abominations were shooting disco lights at seizure and Sorry, sorry, sorry. My feelings for that movie is leaking out again. The meds are supposed to be helping with that. Those aren't medicines. Those are Reese's Pieces. They can be both. <clears throat> anyway, where was I? Oh yeah, the whole should I tune in thing. If you're a fan of the original series or you want to see something completely different than the brooding portrayal of the Dark Knight and you do enjoy over-the-top campiness, then this movie is right up your alley. It's a must-see. Like I said, I personally enjoyed the hell out of this. If, however, you have no clue about the original 60s show, or if you only want your Batman to be dark, serious, Shadow Avenger of Justice, you might want to skip this one. Well, that pretty much wraps up this episode of Should I Tune In. Thanks, as always, for watching, and please give me your thoughts down below. Let me know what you thought about the movie, and talk about whatever you want. That's what that whole section is down there. I always enjoy interacting with my fellow Americans. Make sure you click the bat subscribe button and use the bat thumbs up to give this video a bat like. Until next time, I'm Mr. Eddie, Bat President of America, and... Well, now that the video is over, I'm going to use this opportunity to show that one clip from the end of the movie that has the best Julie Newmar line in it that legit got a good laugh from me. So, spoilers, just warning you. Here you go. I'll give myself up on one condition. What's that? We run away to Europe together, sip tea in a cafe, and live happily ever after. Holy unsatisfying ending. <laughs> I, that, that, I, that was I still like that line alright anyway until next time I'm Mr. Eddie President of America thanks for watching so Robin what did you think of my video wholly unsatisfying ending that's why nobody likes you